Do I look at that or do I look at no, you? Look, look at, at me, yeah. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What are we going to talk about anyway? What are we doing this for? Are <laughs> you wondering every time? What? Are you wondering every time? <laughs> no. <laughs> right, so I'm gonna, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to talk about Spike. Oh, good. Right, so I know that you've got a, a different meaning for the title every time you're asked about So this time I ask you about the meaning of Spike, just straightforwardly. Mm -hmm. What is your today's interpretation of it? It's just the title of the record. It's the name of it. Like some people are called Jared, and this record's called Spike. It's no, it's just the name. Right, so there's been quite a big gap between this one between Spike and the previous albums, two years and a half or something. So what happened in the meantime? Oh, all kinds of stuff. I, I did some... Uh, when I was writing the songs, obviously, that took a, that took a while. And in the uh, meantime, I also collaborated with some different people. Uh, Ruben Blades. I did a couple of songs with him for his record in English. Uh, I did a song by Mail Order with Amy Mann from Till Tuesday. And of course, I did some songwriting with Paul McCartney, some of which led to his record. And a couple of songs which led to mine. Um, my wife and I lived in Dublin for a few months while she was in a film called The Courier and I did the soundtrack for that. So all in all, although I wasn't really in the public eye, I did a couple of small tours um, in Australia and Japan and in southern states of America with a very specific repertoire, not the sort of promoting any particular record. Uh, kind of a continuation of the King of America record where I played with some of the people that played on that album. So a lot of the things I did were just, uh, I followed in interesting offers that I got in, made to me that didn't necessarily have anything to do with forwarding my career as a world-dominating pop star, you know, which is not really my ambition in life. Well, you, see, you said that uh, you tend to get carried away in, uh, in the studio, um, and Spike is a pretty rich album as far as sound goes, so did you get carried away this time? No, I, I, I planned to make it the, uh, as uh, vivid as I could. Uh, the instrumentation was pretty much chosen in advance and we made plans to move from the places where those musicians were. We did some work in Dublin, some work in New Orleans and the rest in Los Angeles and London. And uh, although that sounds very grand, uh, it was really just a practical matter of going where it was cheapest to work with the musicians rather than flying all these like, musicians at great expense halfway across the world. You know. So the three of us producing the record, myself, Kevin Kill and T-Bone Burnett, uh, it was much easier for us to move from studio to studio than move the musicians. Um, each song was kind of cast, uh, in, if you like, you know, there was a story involved. And the music, I felt this time out at least, uh, needed illumination using different instruments than I'd used in the past. I didn't, I didn't uh, ha hear the sounds on my head that you found in the conventional guitar, bass, drums and keyboards lineup. In every case, some of the songs have that sound. Others incorporate bazookis and Ellen pipes and brass bands. And, but it's not, um, it wasn't just a question of sitting around waiting to think of reasons to use those sounds. I thought of the, the sounds first and then found the people that did that best. But there's a lot of people on the album, there's no attraction, so Pete what happened? Pete Thomas plays drums on a couple of things. Uh, yes, well, because for that very reason, there was, uh, I didn't hear that sound. I didn't hear the sound that we make. You've got to understand that the sound that a band makes is not just down to what instruments they play, it's down to who those people are and their relationship to each other and to me and to my songs. And those things change all the time. So anybody that has nostalgic or sentimental attraction, uh, attachment to the attractions uh, is maybe a little mistaken because they're not what they imagine. They're, they're different all the time. We'd be different every, you know, every year that goes by. We all change as people, you know. And therefore, it, it isn't some off-the-peg thing that, you know, that lives in a box somewhere that you can take out and always remains constant. You know, we're individuals, and therefore we change in our attitudes to music and to each other. And uh, on this particular occasion, I chose to work with some different people. Right, Veronica... Just, uh, stop, we'll right. just check something. <coughs> yeah, right. So Veronica, first single that, was, that made quite a lot of noise around the world now, you were surprised by the about a success considering the theme of it and the way it's treated? Well, that was a kind of a deliberate device that the tune would would sound superficially like it was a, something very cheerful and, in fact, it's a kind of serious subject. 
uh, and that's that's a device I've used in the past, and, uh, and it's not a, it's not an entirely original one. Plenty of people have done it. You have a choice between you know with music of either reflecting the lyric exactly, and heaven knows there are plenty of songs that are completely empty in their sentiments, and the music is suitably appropriate. And in this case, I've chosen to contrast that the music is very light-hearted, and uh, I hope it contains some sense of hope which the song has, even though it deals with the woman's mind wandering as she gets older. Yeah, I don't really think there's anything that extraordinary about a song that, that's well-constructed, uh, reaching people as a musical item. Whether or not uh, it, 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 it makes the same sense to everybody is down to the individual. That's, you know, their choice. doesn't imply people don't listen to what you're saying. No, that isn't true, though, because I found, you know, very, very, uh, it's very pleasing to find that, say, in the course of travelling recently, say, in America, I'd be on an, on an airline going somewhere, you know, for the next concert, and uh, somebody like the, the air stewardess would suddenly question me in detail about the song. Even the immigration officer, when I last time I went into America, said, so that's, so in the bridge of Veronica, are you saying, you know, I mean, things like that. Proves that, you know, uh, people that just go on about their ordinary work and hear it on the radio do retain things. It's, it's a fallacy. I mean, too much pop music talks down to people, you know. It does, it's not very high-flown. I mean, what I'm saying isn't a great philosophical statement. It's just a simple story. I just chose to set it, instead of in very somber music, in cheerful-sounding music. You know? Well, again, this... <coughs> I wasn't in England at the time, but when, when Oliver's Army was a big success, again, this very... It was the same device, yeah. I mean, like I say, I have used it several times. Didn't well, and then there's a possible single, maybe, like this town. Mm -hmm. um, well, possibly, that's if... You know, I mean, you can walk down any street anywhere in England and hear eight-year-olds using language which would offend a vicar, you know. Uh, and, and it seems that certain powers that be have a, have a problem with the word bastard. You know, bastard's a fact of life, you know. And uh, the point of the song isn't, that, isn't to outrage anybody by using the word bastard. It just happens to... The full title of the song is You're Nobody in This Town Till Everybody Thinks You're a Bastard. I happen to believe that's a, a creed that some people subscribe to these days, and the song is uh, a not-so-gentle ridicule of that attitude. Um, I don't see any problem with that, with, with that being expressed. I think it's probably good for people to have a song about that because it's so prevalent, but there are certain powers that be that are, you know, afraid of uh, offending their auntie or something that seem to have a problem that might, might prevent it being, you know, uh, exposed in all of the medium that we'd hope, hope it to be. I mean, you stole my question. I mean, I was thinking about like the power, of, the power of words. Do you enjoy like putting bass at the end of a, of a chorus? No, what I mean, what 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 is it? You know, if I was doing it just to kind of shock people, it would be kind of empty because it's not really that shocking. You know, I mean, uh, it's that's the word for that. That would be the word to describe the kind of person that's can, that's described in the song. You know, you could use another euphemism for them. You know, but uh, I chose that one. Uh, I wasn't using it for effect. That just seems to be an appropriate one. It seems quite mild to me. Uh, you know, I could have used much harsher language, you know. But you're still into the pleasure of, of words and the pleasure of, of using words for effects. Well, they, they're supposed to just express something. They're not, really, they're not really for effect. They're not affected in the sense, so they should be... They're what you think about. You know, you try and find the words to convey your feelings or what you observe. So I did, make, uh, I did Paul McCartney reacted to to the song? I don't know, you'd have to ask him. Well, I'm asking you now. <laughs> uh, how did he re in what way? Well, to the lyrical content first. I don't think we ever discussed it. I mean, I, he was the bass player on the track, you know? I mean, you don't always discuss everything in detail with it, you know, you, you don't have to, like, when you do a big, uh, say, uh, uh, horse opera, you know, like with, say, Roman soldiers, you know, like a film, You don't ask the guy at the back holding the banner, you know, why they stabbed Caesar, you know? I mean, it's not important for him to know. So in this respect, he came in, just did a, a bass playing job, so, you know, he wasn't singing it or anything, so I don't see... We didn't question the drum machine that plays the, the beat, you know, we didn't ask the drum machine, tell us what bastard means to you, you know? It's irrelevant. So getting involved into a bit of uh, the detail of the collaboration, what exactly was the collaboration with, with McCartney? Well, it, it consists of about a dozen songs in all, Uh, of different uh, levels of uh, contribution from each side. Uh, we started off with me sort of writing some lyrics for a song that he had already started recording. We continued with finishing the two songs that appear on my album. 
And then we went on, once we got the measure of each other's technique, we were able to proceed quite swiftly to write a, a bunch of songs, uh, four of which appear on Flowers in the Dirt. So, uh, and I think there's, they're, you know, they're really good songs. Uh, there's a couple of, of really good songs also uh, that, that haven't appeared yet, so who, who, uh, who gets to do those is uh, open to discussion at the moment. Like in this town, what, what exactly McConaughey did on it? On this town? Yeah. I just played the bass. I mean, he was in fact the last person to play on the track. I mean, a lot of these tracks were constructed over a period of time due to the availability of the musicians, and you couldn't always plan how the pieces would fit together. Uh, some of the recordings, like the ones done in Ireland, were done pretty much all at the same time. Uh, the ones we did in New Orleans were done like that. Now, some of the stuff that we recorded in Los Angeles was recorded over maybe a couple of months, uh, due to the, when people became available. And uh, in the case of this town, we had Roger McGuinn come and put the 12-string guitar on it uh, the first week of the recording, and the very last week of the recording, we were back in London, and Paul McCartney came into the bass. So he completed the, the picture up until then, the track you know, it did sound unfinished because there was no bass on it, you know. Well, usually when people collaborate or do work with McCartney, they use him as a, as a duo, as a singer. As well, he's, well, he's a great, he's a, he's a terrific singer, you know, and I sang a little bit on his record, but I had already done all the vocal parts. So, you know, I asked him to do the bass, and that's what he, you know, he played bass on two tracks. But, I mean, it's... Because we've collaborated on songs, it tends to get his contribution as a musician out of proportion with the contribution of other musicians, which was equally important to, the, to each track. I'm not belittling it. I was very glad that he came in. He did a unique job because he has a unique style of playing the bass. But we shouldn't get his contribution, you know, as an instrumentalist, out of proportion with everybody else that played on the record. You know, simply because he's more famous than uh, than a lot of us. You know. And as a songwriter, well, what, what did it excite you when when McCartney rang you, basically, or rang the office? Uh, well, it's a challenge, like a, like everything. And like I said, the the two years before I, I released Spike was a series of different challenges, uh, not all of them so laden with apparent meaning as uh, everybody seems to think this is. Uh, it's still just two people sitting in a room trying to write some good songs, just the same way as it was when I was writing with Reuben Blades, you know, or with Amy Mann, or with my wife Cot, who wrote one of the songs on the album, and I just put a little bit of, uh, you know, my sort of uh, chords behind, you know, her melody. Yeah, that kind of duo you do with McConaughey on his album is quite incredible. The one when you're answering back when you're not oh, yeah, really yeah, back. Yeah. That's quite an incredible track. I like that song, yes, I think it's a good song. Right, and then on the same track there's Magin that, that, that played the 12th string guitar, mm -hmm. so he's, he's some, some heroes of yours. So how exactly did that happen when he came down? Well, I happened to meet him in, in New Orleans while we were working with the Dirty Dozen Brass Band. And uh, I, uh, he happened to come a couple of weeks later to do a show in, in Los Angeles and, and I invited him to play on the track because I hadn't really decided who would play the guitar on this town and, and uh, he seemed to have the perfect sound. I'd not seen him play or anything in several years so I had no way of knowing how it would sound but uh, he did a, a very, very imaginative job because there was, there was very little on the track when he played there. There was just my voice and acoustic guitar and a drum machine. And uh, you, know the yeah, you know the birds are reforming so what, what did what do you think they're going to do, and what, what do you think of that? Um, well, from, from what I understand it, it's in order to defend their name, because it was being appropriated by people who had maybe been in the band for ten minutes, um, and the real, you know, founder members of the group, as it were, uh, were, were in danger of losing the, the rights of the name. And um, I think it could be, it could be very interesting. I, I saw them play not so long ago, and their voices still blend very, very well. Of course, they were doing the original material, so there's no saying what the songs would be like. But uh, McGuinn's voice is, is really, really good. I saw him do a show and he had some new songs which were, re which were really good. So, I mean, there's, n there's no saying that he couldn't make a record that would, that would be good, you know? Well, is there a parallel between a song like Eight Miles Island and some of your stuff? In altitude, maybe, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, is there's nothing in play using these people that, that saying that somehow they were doing be better music when they were doing like the birds or the Beatles and stuff, so that's why you're using them. The music was better than it is now. No, I don't think so. You just use people uh, because you know that they are capable instrumentalists, and you hear something in the way they approach their instrument that it's going to, you know, it's an, you're not getting a piece of their legend by using them. That's a mistake to even think that way. And for anybody, any critical person or even a listener to imagine that's what they're hearing, I think is incorrect. Because that's the intention of using them is simply because of the way they approach their instrument. 
Right, so T-Bone Burnett still involved in the in the production very heavily and plays in, in the in the album too. So yes, why yeah. do you follow that relationship with, with Burnett? Uh, why? Yeah. Uh, well, he has a very good sense of the way songs should go. He has a very good way of... Uh, he has a kind of homing device on the meaning and the soul of a song that some producers tend to lose in the machinery of the studio, uh, in that he tends to uh, maintain a relationship with the original notion of the song and your personal feelings about it. Like, it's, I think he starts from the point of view of knowing what the person feels about the material and, and is good at reminding of them of that if they get distracted in the course of making a record out of it. There are two things, you know, involved. There is the writing of the song and then there's the making of the record. And the two things are not always compatible. Sometimes you don't serve the meaning of the song because you get enamoured with some sound that you hear in the studio and he's very good at reminding you of what your original intention was and why you wanted to sing the song in the first place. On the other hand, Kevin Killen, the other producer, was able to take care of making the best of the various sounds that we had. So we had a good balance between somebody who understood the music and knew how to make it vivid and somebody that understood the meaning of the music and knew when we were drifting away from it, if we ever did that. Right. It's talking about the meaning of the album and your, your, your original intentions. It is a very directly political album, probably more direct than a lot of previous works. Um, I don't think so. I think particular songs are interpreted that way, but overall the, the record is a collection of 15 songs with varying different attitudes and subject matter. I can't see how, you know, where's the political intent in Baby Plays Around? Well, no, I mean, there is tracks... Or Pats, Pulls and Claws. There is a hard... I mean, there is some tracks that stand out. Strongly. Then some tracks maybe ha have, but it, I don't see politics as separate from life. It's all part of life. It's, the record's just about little aspects of things that I that I felt or saw over the period of time I was writing the songs. And in another year or however long it takes me to make another record, there'll be other things that'll concern me. But it's not a an absolute condition. Any song that's written there is not an absolute condition. It's not all I have to say or think about something because just like somebody hearing the song hears it one way one day and the next day they hear it another way. Well, I feel the same way. Each time I sing one of those songs, I, they change the meaning of it ever so slightly. You know? That is, so most, a lot of the lyrics are very direct. I mean, you name the names, some of the end of the songs, you, you say, okay, that's, so that's the way it is, and this is England. Well, yeah, that's, that's all there is to say. I mean, that's, that, there isn't anything more to uh, amend the song in that sense, except to sing it again with a different emphasis. But there's nothing more. If I wanted to say more about it, I would have put it in the song, if you understand my meaning. Mm -hmm. And it's or I'd write another song at some later stage, which is the way I feel now, if I change my feelings or something. Same way as everybody has the, you know, the right, and they, they can have the will to change their own life and change the way things are by doing something about it, instead of just complaining. You know? And uh, on the same line, I thought uh, the singing is really expressive, maybe more, again more expressive than, than before. I don't know how to, ex to explain that. Well, I, that's, that, that, I certainly hope that's the case. Obviously, you hope that you get closer to the meaning that you really have. Sometimes you do get that little bit of distance build up in the studio. The technology, the way you hear things, you get in a frame of mind that's different to the way, the frame of mind you were in when you wrote the song, and you somehow lose the, the essence of the song along the way. Well, I don't think that happened in this album. And that's partly due to the fact that I, I've been doing this for 12 years and I know what I'm doing now. And partly due to the fact that I had good people working with me that helped me get to the point, you know. No matter how many instruments play on the album, but there are only as many notes on the album as there are supposed to be. And talking about uh, time and age, is that the fact that you're getting older, is that change your writings, right? and on things like politics, where you suddenly, are, that's why I, I feel it's a lot more direct than before. Well, no, I don't think that's true, because there are songs which people have interpreted as political that are about things other than, say, matters of the heart. I've been writing about ever since I started. The very first record I ever released was interpreted as political record, Lesson Zero. Oliver's Army was interpreted as political record. So I've been doing this for all along. You just, if you just exclude all other feelings and all other experiences of your life from your writing, then you become like a rather cold, analytical person who only looks at politics like something that you keep in a box, like silly putty that you take out and mould into shapes to amuse people so they can have their consciences stroked. 
you know, so that they don't have to think for themselves. You know, we've got people in prison somewhere, somewhere in a, a, a terribly oppressive part of the world, so other people can stand in a football stadium and wave their arms about, you know. Are, you Are we not going to do a track-to-track -track thing, but tell me, because I'm not familiar with English politics, what a uh, Let Him Dangle song is about? Well, Let Him Dangle is a, the story, is a true story of a case that happened in 1952. And, uh, well, without retelling the story of the song, I mean, it, a fellow was hanged for something that he didn't do. And uh, it's one of these cases that's been brought, that's always uh, brought up and re remembered whenever the debate about capital punishment uh, is brought into view. And I read an interview with the man's sister, which was very moving because she, she the way she approached it 30 years later, more than 30 years later, uh, still trying to get some acknowledgement of the mistake that was made, or almost certainly made, um, just led me to write the song. I mean, it's, it's obviously not going to achieve anything in itself in relation to the case, but it's a very good example of, of why it's wrong to have capital punishment, in my opinion. And also it makes comment on the fact that it seems to me that it's used as a political device from time to time to distract people from other concerns. That's what the final verse of the song says. Well, it's string him up. No, the, 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 the idea that when it's convenient, uh, certain people, people of a certain political persuasion will bring the debate, will aggravate the debate about capital punishment because it's politically useful for them to distract people from other, probably more important matters. Because it's a kind of, it's a kind of pointless argument, really. It's already been proven that it is, it doesn't deter anybody, and, it, and terrible mistakes can be made, such as the one described in the song. Uh, it's just used as a distracting device, in my opinion. So, entertainment. What is your definition of entertainment? What What is entertainment for you? No idea. And uh, entertainer, who is who are the, the, your big entertainers? I mean, I know you've been like talking about people like uh, Noam Coward. Mm -hmm. I, I, I hear you in interviews referring to him quite a lot, like yeah. playing some of his records and stuff. So it wasn't Henry and Howard Coward, I think maybe. No, that was Noam Coward. Yeah. Well, Henry, uh, Noam Coward was Henry and Howard Coward's father, you know. I heard, I heard some, some radio shows where you were playing that and saying that you really enjoyed those songs and stuff. Mm. Um, who else? I mean, you talk about uh, S uh, Spike, uh, what's his name? Milligan? Yeah, no, no Spike. Um, uh, Spike the Bulldog? Yeah. Um, who else? Spike uh, the Bulldog's a very good one. Yeah. Is, there, is there something that came in the, for the title of the song? Yeah. No. So anyway, I mean, a lot, a lot of the songs are really kind of... Um, Cabaret in the treatment. Um, I don't know what that means. I mean, well, that means playing half on on on, on the absurd and the, like even down to the arrangement of the, of like when you, the brass arrangements. That's what what you could categorize as kind of ca quite cabaret, like meaning people. I like don't know any cabaret where you can go and hear that music played. I think it's a cabaret of the imagination. Uh, court violence stuff like that. There's a lot of orchestration. Well, exactly, you can't hear that music. I mean, I suppose that stuff lingers in the background. It's a part of a memory of everything that you bring with you when you make a record. Of all the things that you listen to have an influence upon the way you approach the arrangement of the record. But no one thing is a dominant influence, I think, on, on the sound of the record. I don't feel anyway. I don't feel it has a... The comparison is beyond a, a, a passing resemblance such as, you know, seeing somebody in the street who reminds you of your uncle or something, you know? Well, I mean, you already, like, when involved, you, you released a record from uh, Agnes Bernal that was, like, again, like... Well, I was... The, I, yeah, it was on my label. I didn't have anything to do with the making of it. I like your show, the, the, way, the, the, way, the way the show is coming across and stuff. It is very much of a... Not a cabaret, but, I mean, it's in between stand-up and, uh, and just regular singer. Mm, parts of it. Parts of what I do, you know, I try to extend the, the context of the song by, you know, explaining some of the detail of the song in a way. And 
I suppose there's an intention of some satire upon the lamer elements of show business in the cover of the record and in some of the staging that I've used. But it's not a constant thing. It's rather like, um, you know, the, the idea that some of the songs are you know, political as in they're etched in stone. They're not. Same thing goes for the presentation of the use of the instrumentation. It's not a constant thing. You know. Talking about the cover of the album, uh, can you tell us quickly how, how did that go down, like the actual making of it? Well, it was it's as it appears. I mean, I was painted that way and stuck my head through that hole in the wall and that was it. And it was a long and painful process. Well, I've suffered for my art, now it's your turn. Well, who had the, the concept, the idea of that? It was a sort of combination of some images that I had uh, together with Jerry Hyden, the art director at Warner Brothers, who put the thing, s several different ideas, and we kind of together sat down and got that notion together, and then Brian Griffin and his team actually photographed it, made and photographed the thing. Right, so what are the things that make, make you really, that really makes you laugh for the moment, as, as far as entertainment goes? Uh, certain films, you know, uh, no, nothing, nothing, you know, nothing um, immediately springs to mind as being essential. There, are, there are certain, you know, uh, routines and lines and things that you re that seem like to be very accurate in in their in their. Uh, satire or in the way in which they mock a certain human frailty that you can always return to them and even if they don't you don't find them funny in the same way as you did the first time you heard them they still touch you in that way you know i think good comedy has that in it but what do i know i'm not a comedian i'm a singer well you tried your hand at being a comedian you were roscoe in no surrender that was again it wasn't well, saying that. well i was a ma magician in that which is kind of different it's sort of like musician only you say it differently But again, that was an entertainer. Yeah, but it's just a coincidence. I mean, it was a coincidence of casting, you know. So going back to I the got to play with rabbits and you know. Going back to the to, to the arrangements of some of the songs, uh, you feel close to somebody like Tom Waits. I mean, you use some of his musicians, but apart from that, on the like on the arrangements and that. Um, I really like Tom Waits' music. I think it, I think he's probably one of the most imaginative arrangers and songwriters you know, working today. Uh, and obviously I had heard two, you know, two of the members of his band played on my record and I heard things that they did with, in his records and in his shows, I, I, I could imagine that they would work in collaboration with other people, but it wasn't so much that they brought a whole package of sounds with them, you know, they brought their attitude, their approach to their instruments. Mark Rebo, particularly the guitar player, I'd also heard him play with the lounge lizards, so... I'd heard him in, in different contexts and also on record playing classical music. So, uh, you know, I was aware of the extent of their playing. Michael Blair played on King of America, for instance. He played on one of the tracks on King of America. So I, it's not exclusively down to the, you know, I admire it, but I don't think uh, the, you know, the, the, that's where the connection really uh, ends. We, I, I think uh, his music is wonderful, but I, I don't seek to emulate it. He's also a big... Uh a big hero of, of your wife. Uh, yes, she likes his music as well, yeah. yeah. Right, somebody else you, you collaborate with, well, you took from the darkness, basically, Chuck Baker. I uh, took from the darkness, I, I think he... <laughs> no, I don't agree. I mean, he, he was... Where, wherever he was, he was there and stayed there. I didn't take him from anywhere. I mean, he came along and played on my record, and then... I collaborated with him on one other occasion and just shortly before his death he recorded one of my songs that's in the film Let's Get Lost which is a very beautiful sad piece of film Well I was about to ask you about, about a Bruce Weber film so you've seen it? Yes And? It's a it's a one person's particular view of Chet Baker I mean it serves Bruce Weber's artistic designs as much as it serves Jet Baker's music. I don't really think it serves Jet Baker's music completely. I don't think it does it a disservice, but it concentrates almost exclusively on his singing, for one thing, and the way he looked, and the manifestations of, you know, of, of his look and what it represents to different people, and uh, his relationship with uh, his friends, family, girlfriends, and so forth. It's not really a, it's a portrait of a person in, in disintegration, 
that's what it appears to be, rather than of a, of a musician as such. Music's kind of incidental. Did you like the version of Shipbuilding that Chet Baker sang? I d I'm not aware he ever sang a version of Shipbuilding. He sang a version of Almost Blue. Almost Blue, sorry, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, well, I mean, it's a song that I wrote with him in mind, and I gave it to him at, at the time that he came to play on the Shipbuilding. But I had no idea that he'd recorded it until after he died. Uh, you know, I, I, I received it only a couple of months ago. And, it, and it's a beautiful, you know, it's a very deep rendition of the song and also a, a very harrowing piece of film because of the, uh, well, what to me was familiar indifference of the audience to what he was attempting to do. I'd seen that in jazz clubs, but of course it's somewhat exaggerated because it portrays him singing the song at the Cannes Film Festival where there's a lot of uh, drunken, you know, revelers trying to sort of uh, party to his music, which is not really very appropriate, you know. And uh, if you've seen it, you know, he attempts to silence them by singing the, the song, and it's quite a harrowing couple of minutes of viewing. You know? Can you party to Elvis Costello's music? Depends on what song it is, doesn't it? You know, I mean, uh, I... I don't know what that word means. It's kind of like, you know, it's one of those words that's been devalued by repetition. I mean, you can, you can dance to certain songs I made, but that's not the main intention of them. Obviously, you know, I, I, there are moods created, things to be said, melodies to be sung. They all have, they all, uh, you know, hit people in different ways. I have made some records it's possible to dance to, but it's not, it's never been my, my sole and main consideration when approaching any one track that it be danceable. I can't ever recall saying we better make this danceable. It's it's a happy accident of it. If the rhythm contrives to make it danceable, that's great. You know, people can dance to it. You can move to every kind of music. You see, I reject the notion that dance music has to be so stiff. See, I would rather dance to Duke Ellington than I would to, you know, a lot of that so-called dance music. I would rather I would rather dance some music that breathes. You know, like like Willie Maybon or something or Jimmy Reed. And I would, you know, that's my personal taste, so I, you're asking the wrong person about dance music. Da you know, modern dance music just sounds completely mindlessly, uh, rhythmically dull, because it's, cause it's, cause it's divided by computer. But again, a lot of recording artists seem to uh, find it hard to cope with the fact that most of the music now is dance music, and they, they somehow... It's not it dance music, though, it's just, it, it's, it, it's, it's just rigid, you know. It's, it's rigid, it's, it doesn't have any human rhythm to it. Dance requires sinews and muscles and tendons to move. And, uh, uh, you know, you're forcing your body into abnormal rigidness. And the second sign of that is uh, all, all, a lot of recording artists now have been asking the help of uh, African musicians, Asian musicians, what, what, what they call here world music. Because somehow, oh, they've been lost in their ways, or oh, they think, well, this music is too strong, we have to make something out of it. Maybe that's because the rhythms, they haven't, they haven't formulated the rhythm so much. You know what I mean? I mean, to our ears, the, 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 some of the time signatures that are played in, in Arab music particularly are sufficiently unusual to, to, our, to the pulse that we've got ingrained in us over the years, that it sounds very alive and it and to you know Middle Eastern ears it might sound as as absolutely machine like as a Stock Aitken and Waterman record, you know? Like if you go hear you know, fast Bulgarian music as opposed to the choral music, they play in all kinds of they play in seventeen twelve or something, you know, they play in some real strange time signatures. But it it's not an affectation. It's not like watching a jazz fusion band trying to play in that time to prove a point. They naturally play in that in, the, in these strange time signatures, and the pulses are perfectly normal. So to us, they're fresh because we're kind of worn out for for you know. And and to you, you don't want to incorporate, incorporate that to your music. There are things in you know you don't you don't have to put it on like a layer of veneer. You can incorporate it in very subtle ways. Throughout twelve years of working, there are things I just hear bits of it. I don't feel that you have to go to that place. And, and, and baptize yourself in it in order to make yourself credible. I, I don't need anybody's approval uh, in the way I hear things. If I hear something, I might absorb it and synthesize it in a way that you never recognize. You know, If I were to tell you that the, 
the, not this record, but the previous record had a reference to our Wubada record, then, you know, would you be able to tell which track it was on? I don't think so, because it was a passing reference, you know, to an Egyptian record that I heard that I used one little bit of rhythm. You can do it in, you know, you can use it in ways that it that is interesting, and it doesn't have to be, you don't have to show off, you know, you don't have to be, you know, I'm not saying that the people that do that are bad, it just it doesn't concern me that I, that I require other people's approval, that I'm up with the latest trend of which... It's like, it's like uh, people who only go on holiday to places that nobody else has heard of, you know? And uh, you said on, on the release of King of America that you were killing Elvis Costello, the trademark. To some extent, I think that's true. I think that people recognize, if you read articles that are written about what I do, whether it be live, are generally referred to in a variety of names. People have recognized that there is the distinction between the character that was sort of supposedly defined by, say, the first four or five albums that I made and the person that operates today, you know? But we haven't seen you uh, in front of a camera or in, or in front of newspapers that, that much. I mean, you're on cover of Spin this month, cover of Rolling Stone. Most of the covers are all the British magazine. You were doing TV interviews, so... Why, what, I mean, why would I be on the cover of them when I wasn't doing anything? I mean, it really, you only do things like this. I, you know, it isn't a natural process to be interviewed about things. I mean, I, I can't, I have, a, I have an automatic get out of anything I say to you might be a complete lie because it's just what I happen to feel today. And I might get up tomorrow and say, well, actually, I think completely the contrary to that. Because this is an unnatural process. It's part of, you know, alerting people to the fact that there's a record there that might interest them. There's plenty more in the racks. You know, there's other kinds of music. And like, as you pointed out, there's music from all over the world that's interesting. And there's music from way back in time that's, that's interesting, and there's music coming out today that's interesting, and there's music that's coming out today that isn't interesting. I mean, it's, it's all of a, a mass of stuff, and, and it's down to the individual to work out what they need of it. But I do these things, and, you know, it, it doesn't represent anything to me except the, it's an alert. It's like a little light to tell people where it is, you know. But there's you a lot of stuff to navigate yourself through these days. You, know? and you had a really kind of a hilly relationship with the music business, over the last 12 no, years. they've got a hilly relationship with me. I don't have any problem with them. So, like signing worldwide to WEA and like getting suddenly, it is one of the consequences. Suddenly, your record is a hit in America. It's going to be a hit in Europe. Yeah. Well, I mean, there was absolutely nothing stopping it being uh, any of my records being a hit in America because I was with a major record label for 10 years and I had varying degrees of success and varying degrees of satisfaction. And obviously, with a new impetus and, and fresh enthusiasm and no old battles to go back over, it's a lot easier uh, to uh, get you know, through the process of putting a record out and alerting people to the fact that it exists and what it's about and trying to explain the context and trying to correct some of the misapprehensions about it. But really, that's, you know, all, all I can deduce from being on a major record label. They've done a good job by, by the record, but why not? It's a good record. So what is the record about, to come back to, come back to that again? Sorry? So what, what is the record about? Well, it, there isn't... I couldn't sum it up in one you know, glib phrase, I wouldn't attempt to do that for anybody's record and I would hope the main thing is that it's a record of, you know, different thoughts, different feelings, different observations, different kinds of music that I employ to illuminate these things and it's down to each person to react to the songs, I can't tell them how to think. So you're that isn't my job. You're going to move permanently to Dublin? You're uh, leaving London? In, yeah, probably. Well, well, you don't well like I mean, you know, in, in as much, yeah. You don't like, you don't like London? Not very much, no. And uh, well, what is attracting you to Dublin, an island? Well, I have a house there uh, that, that, you know, it's a little bit more space. Somewhere, you know, somewhere I can make a noise without annoying the neighbours. Okay. Fine. Okay? Yeah.